Imagine a ship, a floating city over 963 feet long, slicing through the ocean at nearly 37 miles per hour. That was the legendary QE2. But how? How did they propel such a colossal ship to those incredible speeds? Let's ditch the deck chairs and dive deep into the heart of the ship, QE2's engine room. And this isn't your average engine room. Over her 40 year reign, the QE2 underwent a radical transformation. First, she ploughed through the ocean with steam turbines. Then, in a groundbreaking refit, she was reborn with a cutting edge diesel electric system. And it's this system, the one that made QE2 faster than today's Queen Mary 2, that we're exploring in this video. I'm Chris Frame, maritime history author and your guide on this exclusive behind the scenes tour. When QE2 was re-engined in the 1980s, Cunard replaced a steam turbine system with an entirely new, modern diesel electric power plant, which is still the style of engines used in most of today's modern cruise ships. Picture this, over 4,700 tonnes of scrap metal, the ghosts of the old steam turbine engines, ripped out to make way for the future. New engines, new motors, new propellers, and a complete revolution. This wasn't just an upgrade, it was a total rebirth of QE2. In a diesel electric ship, power is generated by the diesel engines. In QE2's case, these were nine medium speed diesel electric engines. Each nine cylinder turbocharged engine was about the size of a London double decker bus. And as I said before, QE2 had nine of them. QE2's engines were housed in two massive engine rooms, with four in the forward room and five in the aft. As QE2's engine rooms had been designed for big, round steam turbine engines, this space allowed for an amazing view over the top of the power plant, which is really quite rare and not something seen on modern day cruise ships. Now forget everything you know about traditional engines. These weren't direct drive. QE2's diesel electric power plant generated electricity, pure, raw power. Each engine room cranked out 10.5 megawatts. Do the math, that's 94.5 megawatts, enough to power a city the size of Southampton back in 1987. But where did all that power go? Nine megawatts fed the hotel services. Through massive, liquid-cooled transformers, electricity flowed to every light, every elevator, every kitchen, every cabin, everything that made life on QE2 possible. When QE2 was docked, just one of the nine engines could supply the nine megawatts of hotel service power that was required. In reality, they keep more than one fired up for redundancy. Most of QE2's power was used to drive the ship thanks to two giant propulsion motors. Built by GEC England, each propulsion motor was about the size of two London double-decker buses and weighed 400 tonnes. They were rated at 44 megawatts, making them the most powerful marine motors ever built at the time. And there were two motors, one for each propeller shaft. QE2's propeller shafts were 229 feet long and were each connected to five-bladed, controllable pitch propellers. But here's the kicker, whether the QE2 was gliding into port or tearing across the Atlantic, those shafts spun at a constant speed, 72 revolutions per minute in port or 144 RPM at sea, no matter what. So how did this floating giant actually change speed? How did she go from a gentle glide to full throttle sprints? The secret, controllable pitch propellers. It wasn't about changing the shaft's rotation, it was all about the angle of the propeller blades. By adjusting the pitch, the QE2's crew could precisely control her speed, a system still used on many of today's cruise ships. But here's the most mind-blowing part. How do you go in reverse? On older ships, you throw the engines into reverse, changing the direction that the propeller shaft spins, not on the QE2. Instead, they changed the pitch to the propeller blades and boom, from over 30 knots, she could come to a dead stop in just three minutes and 38 seconds. QE2 also had two bow thrusters used to help maneuver the ship in port. They had their own drive motors and electricity for these was also provided by the diesels. These days, most modern cruise ships have three or four bow thrusters, making them far more maneuverable than QE2. Though QE2 did have more stabilizers than modern ships, four Denny Brown units, while most cruise ships only have two. The extra pair was useful in the rough Atlantic that QE2 was built for and the same setup is used today on the newer Queen Mary 2. In addition to the engines and motors from 1987, QE2 had an advanced energy recapture system to reduce costs. 
Heat recovery boilers were attached to each diesel exhaust pipe. Heat from the engines was used to generate steam for kitchens, central heating and water heating, as well as steam for the commercial laundry on board and other hotel services. There were also two gas-fired boilers to use for backup heating. The engines also powered huge refrigerated areas where fresh produce was stored, as well as providing power to run seven air conditioning compressors, 186 pumps, and 178 industrial-scale air ventilation fans used throughout the ship. QE2's diesel power plant served the ship till 2008 and still had a lot of life left in it when the ship retired. This wasn't just an engine room, it was a powerhouse, a testament to human ingenuity. It is this incredible story, this hidden world, that makes the QE2 so unforgettable. Join me next time as we delve deeper into the secrets of maritime history, and don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more maritime history videos. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope you found this video interesting, and until next time, I hope to see you on board.